All right, I'm gonna add some hi-hat to this. Let's see, where is it? I'm gonna, I need just a little bit more rhythm in this basic, basic drum groove. Excuse me. I got coffee today, by the way. Um, okay, I'm gonna boost this. And then, oh, you know what? I want to go eighth notes, or actually, these are quarter notes. We'll go to the drum kit and boost the hi hat a little bit. Morning, Holly. Morning, Bob. Sam, what's going on? All right, going to the drum kit here in Logic. I'm going to click on the hi hat and the drummer. I'm going to turn the gain up a little bit so I can have a little bit more subdivision I could do bass where's the bass here it is should do all right that'll help a little bit all right so give me a minute we're gonna I'll wait for some people to come in things we talked about before when we talked about soloing and I think we mentioned it I mentioned it in this series um, was to sit on one note through the progression and see how it, that note changes um, um, emotions um, you know that note has a, a, a certain um, emotion over this chord and then a different emotion over a different chord and different emotion over each chord so I, I sat we're in the key of C the progression is C, G, A minor, B, F. So it's just a basic one, five, six, four progression. Very common progression. It's basically let it be. Uh, at least the first four bars of let it be. Um, and I'm sitting on a D note. So if you look down here, over here, at the um, notes in the chords, only one of these chords actually has a D note in it. Uh, the D note over C is our second. We talked about the second, the two one resolution, the two three resolutions, and we're going to talk about the six five resolution today. Um, and we're going to work next week. We're going to touch on. Uh, we're going to talk about the seventh, um, but uh, we're just going to work on the six today, six five and five six, both both directions. Um, and then, but the G chord has a D in it. So when you play the D over the G, it's going to be like, oh, okay, that sounds appropriate. And then the D over the A minor is the four or the 11. You can think of it as the 11. It doesn't matter. I don't want to confuse you. There won't be a quiz on this, but just know I broke my, there won't be a quiz on this mug. Sorry. Um, and over the F, it's the six, which we're going to talk about the six today. Um, but when I was over the F chord, I kind of did. I went to the E note. I could have gone like that. To me, that almost, it's its harder to think about. Like you have to be aware that you're on the F chord. So it's a little bit more like a, this is a thinking man's lick or note choice. Otherwise you're just in this basic A minor pentatonic, which you can totally play. Again, we're, I'll talk about approaches to soloing too. I have, and I will continue to. Um, you can just play a pentatonic scale over this whole song. You could play a, a diatonic scale over this whole song. Um, technically, what we're going to do when we learn that sixth today of each of these chords, 
we're creating what's six note chords. We've got the root, the third, and the fifth, and we're adding the second, the fourth, and the sixth. So that at one, two, three, four, five, six, that makes it a six note scale. Essentially, what we if we if we use all of those suspensions, if we do use the two, the suspended second, the suspended fourth, and the suspended sixth, we add that to the triads, and we got a total of six notes. So, like all of those notes will work pretty good over the C chord and over the over the G. We have that should work pretty good over the over the um, over the G chord, and then should work pretty good over the A minor and. So it's uh, we're essentially by taking the triads plus the suspensions, we're, we're creating these six note scales. So one more than a pentatonic and one less than a diatonic. A pentatonic would be a five note scale and a, a diatonic would, would be a seven note scale. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's easier. Uh, it, it's just different. Um, and so when I play a D over each one of these chords, it has a different um, kind of je, je ne sais quoi. I don't even know what that means. Certain something. Uh, and each one of them has a different something. That F might be something that Jimmy Page would have done, right? He did it in, uh, I think, according to Rick Beato, I think three times in that uh, Stairway to Heaven solo. I know, he, I know he did that. He lands on it really soft, but that, it's it's this one. He does do it there. I realize that now for years I taught it. I think I pretty much taught it with an E, not an F. It went by so fast I didn't catch it. A lot of times you go back, you've been teaching a song a thousand times and then you teach it again and you go, oh wait, I've been teaching it this way and that's not right. So, um, je ne sais quoi. I don't know what. So, yeah, I don't know what. Okay, yeah. So, kind of the same as a certain something. Because a certain something has a, a, a vagueness to it when you say, there's a certain something. It's kind of the same thing. I, I don't know what it is. So yeah, je ne sais quoi. That makes sense. Thank you, Sam. Sam is our fountain of knowledge. Thank you, Bruce, for all the, the paperwork there. Uh, greetings from Michigan. Greetings from Los Angeles. Yeah, it's a certain mysterious something. And it's like, why does that work? It's not in the chord, but it's kind of... It's kind of why the C note works really well, even the, though it comes, there's a C note in all three of these chords, three of the chords, not in the G chord, but even over the G chord, the C kind of works because you know you're going back to a C chord. It's kind of this setup. Um, yeah, I mean, you could literally. So, uh, yeah, I'm just hitting that high C note. I mean, a very common kind of blues thing to do is just sit on that root note and just wail on it. Uh, maybe change up some rhythmic things happening or the way you approach the note um, or approach the string. Uh, I like I, I mentioned this before. There was a band when I was a, I just looked up this guy too. So he's still on Facebook and everything. I think I I followed him his career, but. I mean, this would have been 40 years ago, and I was working at a, I was running sound at a nightclub called Rosie's in Rosemead on Rosemead Boulevard. And I was running sound, and there was a band that would play there called the Lost 45s, and they did Dizzy Miss Lizzie. And it's like, it 
whatever, you know, it's like that. Well, Mick was the guitar player. He would literally play that. He wouldn't ever do it the same way twice. Like, I think if you count it up, it's like 26 times or something, or probably even higher than that. He had 26 different ways of playing that lick and kind of... Or I forget all, you know, it was just, it was like he made it, he may have done some rep repetition in there, but he really kind of was almost treated it like a, 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 a test or an exercise in um, variations, theme and variations. So, uh, yes, anything I do graphic wise, if I create um, some kind of uh, ping, ping image, if I do a screen grab or something like that, I'll drag it in there. Also, I did put this track without the bass and the hi-hat. But just the, basically the piano, so you can practice soloing over it if you want. And that MP3 is up there in Discord. You can play it through Discord. You can download it. I don't care. Um, uh, I I wasn't going to put it up as a uh, jam track just because uh, I did one already for, I forget it was, the original. I did this one. Is it this one? <laughs> too loud but you get the idea um so uh i do have coffee today so I, the sinusitis is gone my eye infection is gone um and so uh i thought oh let me see if because i had been i had the sinusitis for quite a while and i i wonder if the coffee was kind of uh, I was getting kind of like heart, not heart, I don't want to say heart palpitations. My hands were shaking and um, uh, not like that, but like I could perceivable for me because I'm very sensitive to anything to do with my hand and finger joints. I'm very aware of that, of course, right? Uh, and so just like a runner would be of their feet or their knees. Um, Anything that's like out of the unusual, out of the usual uh, feeling for that appendage. So, hey Zach, what's going on? Good to see you, man. Teach the people. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we're going to talk about. We talked about the second of these chords. You know, two one. So the like over C, right? The two one uh, or two three over the C. Uh, over the G, the two is an A. Or you could go. We did that. Remember, we, we played over. That's why I elongated this progression. So it's really long. Now we're going to go to the 2 1 over A. And then 2 1 and F. And these are. The, the, whole, the whole reason for this is, is, a, is a starting point to give you, these are all just, because the, 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 probably the hardest note in a solo is the first one. <laughs> that's the hardest note. You go, oh, it's, you got to play these fast. And it's like, yeah, that's hard too. But the hardest thing is like, what are you going to start on? And, um, uh, and so this is, just a, this is just a way for you to go, oh, okay, let me think a little outside of the triad so it's not too inside. I always like, I always like the the pretty tones. That 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 second or ninth over that A minor chord is just magical. It just sounds so good. I mean, all the twos sound great. I guess it's like that B note over the F chord. Woo! It's that. Remember that's that Lydian. Woo! You're you're. You're making a sad movie with that one. So, I mean, you could sit on a B note. Any of these notes you could sit on, and they're all going to have a different relationship, okay? If I sit on a B note, it's going to be the seventh of the C, the third of the G, the second of the A, and the sharp 11 of the F. So every one of those relationships is different. If I take... Playing the B note with the different roots. C root, G root, A root, F. They all, it, 
it speaks differently to each one of those roots. And that's where you can have tension and release. Um, and the only release with the B note is going to be over the G chord. The G chord is the only one where it's going to be inside. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but, but you, you, it, you know, sometimes you can sit on that, that second. Like, for example, if we sit on the second for the C chord. It resolves by itself when the chord changes. You don't have to change the note. That's what's crazy sometimes about a simple solo, a simple melodic idea. Um, and so often we think, we, oh, it's a solo. I've got to, you know, you know, I got to, I got to go, I got to go all Leonard Skinner on it, you know. <laughs> and it's just like, uh, I mean, trust me, I'm, I'm as guilty of that. Uh, of that as any guitar player um i i oftentimes will be like oh man you know i, I just want to i get this is my moment to shine these are my four bars you know and it's like no uh because maybe people will remember that but they're much more likely to remember something where you you all you kind of create a melody the idea is really to for me i've never liked i don't mind soloing in a jam band or in a rock band but in a pop scenario i always felt like a uh, hey dynasty what's going on um in a in a pop scenario, man, I, I feel like it, it's kind of it's kind of like a movie. Okay, if you've got a ninety minutes to sell a story and it's a pretty big story, you don't really waste any time. It's part of the reason why I feel like I almost like extended series a little bit better, you know, or you know, or limited series like maybe eight episodes kind of thing, because. Um, uh, because you can have scenes and shots in the, in the show that don't necessarily have any foreshadowing or, you know, it's like in a movie, 90 minutes and a guy enters a room and the camera sh look, you know, sees a baseball bat in the corner. You, you immediately know that that baseball bat is going to have some, some relevance, you know? Well, that's kind of how I feel like with a, a pop guitar solo, if, you know, there's not any wasted space in a three minute pop song. You know, everything has to serve the song. And if you've got a solo where you're just kind of going off and being a guitar player and it doesn't move the song forward at all, um, then I feel like that's kind of a wasted opportunity. I feel like you really want to have something in there if you're going to have a solo in a pop song, again, which is extremely rare, um, where you... Uh, uh, where you, you it, it makes sense like the song would be maybe lacking a little something if it wasn't there if that makes sense so voice leading exactly yeah the the these these suspension tones so basically we're talking about one three five and then the susses are two four six we're going to talk about the six today um but if again we just look at the c scale right here c d e f g a b c i wrote two octaves of it so we can start on any note and do a whole octave if we need to um but with the c we go one is c three is e five is g there's our triad one three five c e g that's what basically c chord is made up of just c e and g that's it um, and then when we talk about the susses, we're talking about D, which is the two, and D could go down to C or up to E. The F, which is the four in the, in the C chord, and it could really wants to go down to E, very strong. But you can resolve it up too. And then the A, which is what we're going to get to today, is the six. So if you go to the five, go up one scale tone in the five, and that's that's going to be your six. And so that's an A. And that's that's a real common suspension too. I, I almost am hard pressed to say which of the three suspended suspensions, two, four, or six, are the most common. I almost think the six is the most common because of this lick. Right? It's like, I'm just gonna play just the C chord here. All those licks are utilizing the sixth suspension. So we have the root. 
and then we have the fifth, and then we have the sixth. Okay, so like here, put your pinky on this. If you have an electric guitar, you can do this. Put your pinky on the thirteenth uh, fret of the second string, and then put your third, uh, third, second, and first finger on the third string right below it. Okay, so your third finger should be on the twelfth fret, and push that string up if you have it on electric, and try to go to this note. Don't go below it. I mean, if you want to. That would be a C minor lick. Um, but we'll go there. We don't. You could go past it. You get to if you go past it, get to that seventh. We'll talk about that next week. Or kind of a pedal steel lick. It's kind of a kind of a thing that you, when guitar players want to imitate pedal steel, they're you know it's like. So you can do that, you can bend it up, hit the C, hit it again and bring it down. So you're doing five, six, root, six, five. So you're doing a five, six suspension and a six, five suspension or res resolution. But we can also do it like this or like that. But if, you, if you're on acoustic, maybe just bar the top two strings at the eighth fret, like a Chuck Berry kind of. Okay. And then we're going to hammer on the sec uh, two, two frets up on the second string, so we're going to go to the 10th fret, and then hit that top string, and then hit that A note again and pull it off to the G note. So G, A, C, G, uh, G, A, C, A, G. Do that let's just go through all of the susses so here's our c triad right here third fret i'm sorry third uh sorry fifth fret fourth just bar at the fourth third and second string all right and there's our triad we have the fifth here the root here and the third here so we have if we play the second third string root or one Second string three, and then play the fourth string five. If you play it fourth string, second string, and and third string, you get the MBC logo. It's just a major triad. Okay, so the six, if we go up from the fourth on the fourth string, go up two frets. That's a six five suspension. On the on the third string, it's a two one suspension, and in here it's it's a four. Four three suspension. You can do them all if you want. So, uh, so basically, like I said, you create this kind of six note scale. It's one more than a pentatonic and one less than a diatonic. And it gives you a lot of options right there in a very, a very easy to handle, really easy to get under your fingers kind of positioning. All right. Uh, the A minor chord, we could, we could see it down here if we want. Now with the A minor, if we go here, we start on A, A, C, E is our triad, B was the second, D was the fourth, and we have a weird kind of sixth. It's not going to be up a whole step up from the fifth. It's only going to be a half step or one fret from the fifth. I mean, if I played, so we get to the, uh, oh, wait, the second chord is G. Uh, let's, now well, we're talking about A, so let's just keep talking about A minor, sorry. Here's A minor. So there's a 2-1, or 2-3, 2-1. Here's the 4. 4 can go up to 5. 
I mean, the 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 two in the A minor, the two over the major chords, uh, over all three major chords, C, G, and F, the two is a whole step away from the root, and it's a whole step away from the third. So it could go either way, right? The two in the A minor chord is is kind of a half step away from the, the three. So a lot of times that wants to resolve up, but I hear it going down too. So I, I, for me, it's about a 50-50 proposition. I may take it to C, I may take it to A in that scenario. Uh, but the D, that fourth in the key, in A minor, that, that fourth, um, is a whole step away from the third and a whole step away from the fifth. So it could go either way. So I can hear it going up to E or down to C either way. Now we're going to get, if we count up again, we got A, C, E. So we have the A, which is the one, two, B is the two, C is the three, so D is the four, E is the five, and there's the six is a half step away. So we're gonna have some rub. Okay, so that's an A minor chord with an F in it. It's kind of cool, but it's also kind of dark. It almost sounds like a mysterious. And all I'm doing is I'm I'm playing a, a little F triad here with an open A and an open E on top to get all the notes in the A minor chord plus that F. So what I'm playing there, I, I don't even know what I would call this chord. I, I might call this F major seven over E, but I'm basically playing nothing then open and seven, six, and boom, like that. Uh, that's the voicing I'm using right now. So come on, let's get some more people. Don't forget to hit that, smash that like button. You got hearts here, I'm gonna add a heart, 100% heart, smiley face. Boom, party. Oh, what? <laughs> so, uh, I, you know what? I, uh, Holly, if you want to post up on uh, Discord that I'm on, because some people have Discord notifications turned on, but they don't have uh, that. Um, I can I can post something right now. Here, hold on a second. Where? Um, oh, here it is. Share. Copy. All right. Let me just, let me just go to... Uh, Nope, not that. <clears throat> Twitter and post really quick. Uh, boop, there we go. All right. See, let's see if we get anybody else coming, showing up. Oh, you did. Okay. You kind of always do that, don't you? I appreciate that. I appreciate it. All right. So... I don't have notifications turned on for Discord, but I do have one of my composers that reaches out to me that way, like, oh, I've uploaded files, so I have to remember to check in. Otherwise, I say, hey, do you see those files I uploaded last week? I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> so I have to check. Um, let's see. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so that, yeah, so that, that six over the A minor is a little, but but boy, it says something though. Play that F, sixth fret, second fret, and then resolve it to the E. You can even use one finger. You can use your pinky if you want to. You can use your nose. I mean, there's, because it's a minor chord and you're playing a note that's creates a lot of rub, but it's a lot of like the, the second. There's something hopeful about that though. There's something hopeful about that, that B note going to the C that the F note going to the E doesn't have. It's like, oh no, something's wrong. But that would be called. Um, uh, you would you could refer to that as being um, very aeolian. 
um, very minor. It, it really points out the fact that you're playing over a minor chord. Um, and I'm going to uh, we're going to discover this. If you look at it, the, all these triads, the C triad, the G triad, and the F triad, the three major triads, all of their sixes are a whole step away from their fifth. Okay, so in every case, when we play over the C, that's the five, six, one. When we play over the F, it's the same thing. And when we play over the G, it's the same thing. So the five, six relationship on the three major chords in, the, in this progression are all a whole step. So they're all the same. It's only the, the, F, uh, the A minor chord that has a half step relationship between the five and the six, okay? It kind of makes oh oh was he did he work on yeah he did I think he did the pre-show thing the the Grammy he, he kind of does that every year there's really I wish I could do those I mean I could totally do them it's funny because Tim doesn't really read either but he can read chord charts so um Yeah, I've never heard the term hepatonic for 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 diatonic. Uh, and dia dia means two, right? Or does it mean multi? Um, but yeah. And I want to get too deep in the weeds here on, especially with semantics and uh, jargon. I don't want people to get too. But it's pretty easy to see the if you see the like the A minor triad A C E. Here you can easily see the suspensions, the two. So you see the one, three, five, and you can see two, four, six. Okay. So the so the second chord is G. So G we have G B D. The D is the fifth. E is the sixth. All right. So over the G chord, which is I should have done second, but I did. I'm doing it third. Here's the G chord. <laughs> Okay, so over the C chord, we have A to G. Over the G chord, we have E to D. And over the A minor chord, we have F to E. And then over the, um, over the uh, F chord, we have D to C. Okay, so I'm going to pull up. So the F chord, uh, the six in the F chord is a D note. I'm going to pull up the whole progression now. All right. So here's our little pattern. We're going to go. Okay. Four. And then to here. Six, five, and G. And then we're going to go up a fret. Down to E. And again, there should be some tension in that six. It's not nearly as strong as the four, the suspended four. Um, or even the second in some cases, but uh, it's there's definitely it definitely wants to be resolved, and it in this case because the the root is a third away, it the the resolution is really strong six five. But I like I said, going to the root is very common too. So technically, I'm doing five six to one. Oops, sorry. But but I could go back down to five. And I could also do six, five. That's what we're going to do here. So again, here's our pattern. Yeah, that's the crazy thing about dulcimer is you can only play a major scale. So you're here for the jargon. <laughs> exactly. I want to sound as smart as I can sound. <laughs> okay, then we have six, A minor chord. Woo! That actually is the most. Okay, all right, A note here. chord Ooh.
-hmm. Now, just as just kind of to center you here, the, that six five is a very common suspension. We do it when we do old school rock and roll. <laughs> if I were to accommodate the minor. Oh, for new dulcimer strings. Oh, yeah. You probably just have to order at Amazon or something. Um, I have several dulcimers. I actually had a chromatic dulcimer built so I could play any note. Um, but you don't really see them ever in the wild. You actually pretty much have to have someone build it for you. Um, so I... Um, mountain made dulcimer... Well, mountain... Is that... Am I thinking the mountain made music... Yeah, this uh, this guy. This, I bought a couple of my. Uh, I bought one dulcimer from him, the chromatic one, um, and I bought my. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, he has lap harps harps too. Um, those are actually really cheap, um, but he does he does psalteries, but let's see if he still makes those. I mean, $125 for a really handmade lap, American-made lap. It's crazy. Uh, let's see, dulcimer accessories, books, lap harps. Okay, he doesn't have dulcimers. Uh, or, I'm going to see if he's got a search window. Because I bought my psaltery from him. No. So I wonder if he's not making those anymore. There are a lot of strings. Um, but they're kind of fun, but, but dulcimers, let's see, I actually wouldn't mind getting a bass dulcimer, like a really low one with big strings. Again, I wouldn't mind having one that had, um, and they can get up there. He, he has some more, oh, he makes hammer dulcimers though. That's a lot of strings. Huh. 11, 12, what do I have? I have a, are those three strings? Those two strings. Uh, mountain dulcimers, though. Yeah, it's, uh, dulcimers, dulcimers are really cool. They're a cool bow, too. I like to bow my dulcimer. It's a beautiful sound. I mean, you only have three strings, or sometimes you have two, a double string. Oh, wait, here's, it does have a chromatic one here for sale. Where was it? Right here. Yeah, this is what I got. Um, yeah, and it's, it is. Um, and so dulcimers basically just have a diatonic scale. So like the second fret's missing, or the first fret's missing, the, the third, let's see. So it'd be just the second fret, the fourth fret, the fifth fret, the sixth fret. And then what, what they do, or the, the, sorry, seventh fret, and then what they'll often have is the major seventh, the dominant seventh, so you have both options there. But, yeah, it's it's kind of cool. I, I haven't played it for you guys lately, but I could get one out and play it, show you. Do I have one in here? I do not have one in here. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, double melody string and then middle and bass, exactly. And it's tuned root, fifth root, usually, like D-A-D or C-G-D-C -C or whatever. Okay. So, now the, the six over the F chord, let's just look at that. The F triad is F-A-C. And the... the that six is a whole step above the fifth, C. So we have a D note. So that's, uh, and again, it kind of has that wants to go to the, wants to go back to the fifth kind of thing. And, 
And again, I don't know that I would ever do a solo where I do the six, six, five, six, five, six, five, six, five over the four chords like that. Um, I would let it maybe use the six, use, you know, one of the, one of these uh, tones here, uh, six, five, whatever tones, um, to uh, get me started. Um, like, actually, I like, like if I go, I might do that again. And then I might go to that. That might be my solo. Uh, that would be a very, uh, what's his name? He might do it down an octave. Um, uh, uh, I can see his face. Uh, so, you know, and, and maybe with more of a clean sound, but I can, I can get it here. Uh, let's see. nice solo right there that's to me that's more again context is everything and obviously this is kind of a chill tune the drums the bass the piano it's all telling you it's kind of like yeah we're just kind of chilling out and so what I did there was I, I did that uh, six five suspension over the C but I also put a C in it then I did the same two notes over the G but I put a B in there to, to say, oh yeah, I know I'm playing over a G chord. Okay, and then. And so then I went to a F note over the F chord, but then I went down to the major seventh, which we haven't talked about yet. So we haven't talked about that, but that's a, that E note over the F is a beautiful tone. Again, I'm, I'm always looking for those money chords, those are money notes. The notes are like, they're just money. People are like, yeah, here's here's $100 for playing that note. part of that that last four bars I played the five or the six five six five over each one of those chords and it, it worked and I was like over the, over the C chord I was like and I did that totally worked so yeah that five six so let me let me write this down because we need to have you need to have eyes on it Okay, so can I duplicate? Let's see, what is this one? Oh yeah, here we go. Copy, copy. Now what? No, 
Oh, I think it's in here. No. Okay, it's fine. I'll just do a new new text thing here. Uh, six. Okay, let me make this a lot smaller. Ultimately, I'm just going to put it, oops, not, I'm going to put it right here. I kind of want it to be, what's the size on this? Do I have a, ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. select font, what's the size? 256, really? That's 256? Okay. So let me just see if I can change this to 256 so I can make it, oops, ah, wrong way. No, that can't be right. Okay, whatever. It's so the fonts aren't. It's the font numbers aren't corresponding. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So enough of my shenanigans. So the E or the C chord. <clears throat> sorry, that's going to be um, G. Sorry, A to G is going are are the the six to the five or five six. You can think of it either way. Um, and then the G chord is the second chord in the progression, and that is going to be E to D. <clears throat> the A minor is, is going to be that sweet F to E. And then the F chord is going to be that uh, D to C. All right. And again, once we... I think those are bold. Let me make it bold. Once we add up all the, the root, you know, 1, 3, 5 with the 4, 5, or 4, 2, 4, 6, we're going to end up with a... Um, we're going to end up with a, t a kind of a six note scale for each of the chords. I don't really think that way, but maybe I do sometimes because I don't really avoid this. There's no reason to avoid the seventh. We're going to talk about the seventh next week. So ultimately I, you can create a six note scale, uh, hex hexatonic scale. <laughs> Is that what you called it? Uh, Sam. Um, and, uh, but, um, Hmm. Oh, I guess you could do AA on top. I've never thought of that. Yeah, you could totally do that. that. That would, yeah, yeah, that would work. Oh, yeah, definitely that progression. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely a kind of an R&B. I could hear it go, totally going R&B. Very, very R&B. Especially if you had, like, C major 7 chord, you know. If you put 7, so don't, you know, if you went, we were like, Oops. Yeah, I could totally hear kind of an R and B pop kind of vibe to it too. So, uh, yeah. Um, Uh, what's the put up a parking lot? I, you know, there's a video of um, Joni Mitchell playing um, uh, playing uh, dulcimer, uh, playing that song on dulcimer. I don't know if it was originally played on dulcimer. I, maybe it was. Oh, Big Yellow Taxi. Thank you. Um, but she played dulcimer a lot. I think that's kind of got probably what got her started on open tunings because she's an open tuning beast. Well, she doesn't really perform. I, mean, I don't even know when the last time she performed was. I mean, I think she did like a couple songs somewhere recently, but it's been it's pretty cool. She's she's amazing. All right, so that six five resolution. We don't really have the six seven. It doesn't go to the seven. I mean, this you can go to the seven. It's not a problem. It's all it works. Um, when you do the rock and roll thing. <laughs> Technically, you're going to one. Uh, you're going five, six, seven, six. However, you go into a dominant seventh or a minor seventh instead of a major seventh. And technically, that's not in the key of C. If you were to do it totally in the key of C, it would be like. You know that sound. And 
that's a whole nother vibe. That doesn't sound bluesy at all. It's kind of a play on on the uh, this rock and roll thing. It, it really came from blues, and so the, having that dominant tonic chord, that C7 as the one chord, and then, and then the, the four chord is a seventh chord, and the five chord is a seventh chord. You just basically have three seventh chords. So, what's going on, six nine? Yeah, and Beato, uh, uh, six nine says Beato mentioned a six note scale um, in the video last year. Yeah, and you know technically you can make up any scale. I, I when I was a kid, I made up, I tried to invent every scale. Um, you know, I mean, is it two, are two notes a scale? I mean, is C? Um, I mentioned um, the uh, Oppenheimer theme. Um, so it, it's it's basically he took uh, he's in the key of C. I mean, I'm sorry, he's in the key of G. Um, let's see, what's it? Uh, let's see. Uh, got a pattern, uh, 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 Ludwig um, Gorenson has a pattern, all right, and um, the pattern is kind of like one, two, three, uh, ascending, it's basically, if you were to take, uh, let's see, it's, how can I describe it, oh, it's kind of like a one, two, three, uh, it's not consistently like that. Uh, but it's, it's, so the scale is, <laughs> is, let's say it's an E minor scale with no A in it. So no matter where you start on the pattern, you go up three notes in the scale and then skip a note. Um, so if you start on E, F sharp, G, you're fine. And skip. Um, right? Let's see. Or do you skip two notes? It's a pattern. Oops. Um, so you're kind of going one, two, three, five. Now, one, two, three, six, seven, five. But it doesn't work out that way because if any one of those notes is an A, you skip it. And I think the reason he skipped the A was the A symbolizes Adam. A for Adam. Um, and the movie was about splitting atoms. Don't know if that was his thinking, but I just noticed, oh, the A is missing. Uh, but there is A in the bass. Um, but it's like, you know... Anyway, it's interesting. He created a six-note scale, um, and then the then it goes to a descending pattern, and it's the same. It's the same formula. So the pattern is is um, uh, is 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 repeated every bar, and so it's fascinating. It's it's it was almost like a mathematical. Uh, in fact, it was intentionally that way. He definitely wanted to have kind of use math. And combine it with music, and I think that was really interesting. Um, the the real challenge was performing it because the tempos changed every eight bars or so. Um, and so what they ended up doing was um, not only the tempo change, but the rhythm figure over that tempo change. So they went from quarter notes to, I mean, from eighth notes to eighth note triplets, back to eighth notes at a new tempo, and back to eighth note triplets. And it was never the rhythm was never a form of the previous 
or was never a subdivision of the previous rhythm so that's what made it so like what um okay now um with this uh with these notes with these suspended notes with that with your when you're armed with this you have a lot of options and so like i said you probably wouldn't do five six five six five or i'm sorry six five six five six five six five over all three chords um but you could start out with a six five and then see where that takes you if i do six five on c i land on a g note well the next chord is g so i could do that again and I, i'm doing a two one so if i go oops click here Hey, Dennis, what's going on? And then again. And now that one is one we haven't talked about yet. That that brings in the seventh over the A minor chord. Okay. Um, so then, then we could go to the, like that. Basically, what I did there was uh, six five over the C chord, and then two one over the G chord, and then I went. I I just love the sound of that two one in the A minor chord, and then that four that sharp four to the three. Woo! I mean, that's just. that's I did the same lick twice in a row in both so the this the a um, yeah the a to g over the c has a different sound than the a to g over the g chord has and then the b to a over the f I mean over the a minor has a different sound than it has over the over the f chord and so with saying very little I mean I'm playing three notes total here I'm play, playing G, A, and B. And I said so much. And now what you can do, like, and again, this, this, there's an MP3 of this progression for 10 minutes up on the Discord. So you can, you can download it and practice along with it and kind of come up and, and just start to work on these concepts. Um, and, and maybe at first just playing the chords and try to find a lot of different way, voicings of the chords all over the fretboard. One of the ways that you can take this little bit of information and explode it is to find tr these triads or little triads little chords all over the fretboard and you might use the you might use the uh, cage method to do that you can do this this d major shape you can find it here's f here's g here's c and then here's a minor so you can find all of those and you can just play those find the A form. Here's the A. I'm set to C and then, oops, sorry, uh, it goes to G and then A minor and then to F. It's actually the exact same voicing as, as this one. It's just on these, these string, this string grouping, um, the second, third, and fourth strings. So see this note, see this F triad here is the same as this F triad. But starting to see those all over the fretboard will allow, you know, will really start to open it up. And then now you go, oh, the triads. Okay, that's fairly easy to start to see the triads eventually if you work on it. But you can just take this progression and just find these triads. There's another kind of the E form. A minor is here. Fifth fret. And then a little F chord. Go up an octave. Maybe go to this C. This G, go to this A minor, go to this F, uh, and, and really that's often how I would create a rhythm part. You know, I might just like.
so it it um you will start you know as you start to see um triads up and down the fretboard um, you can just use this progression progression as a tool to to give you a pace and a and kind of a uh a test a speed test to see how quickly you can change you can slow it down and speed it up too uh, but uh, a, a test to see how um, quickly you can find the triads for each of these four chords um, and then once you do that then you can start to see okay which one of these uh, on these triads which one is the root which one's the third and which one's the fifth and from there you can go okay well if I know where the root is I know where the second is okay so that that very simple Right there, what I did, I did the same solo, the same three note solo that I did before, but I displaced the octaves. I played the first lick in one octave. I went up an octave for the repeat of that lick, so it didn't sound like exactly the same thing. Okay, so I went A to G. Again, I'm talking about soloing concepts here. This is, whole lesson is what this is ultimately about. I could have done that twice, it would have been fun. To change it up a little bit and go up an octave right and then the same thing I could have stayed there I could have stayed there but I, I, I wanted to go up just to make it a little different So you get the idea that you, you you can keep it really simple, but then you can do you can do certain tricks, change octaves, uh, change the approach to the note, change how long you stay on a note. Like for example, I could just hint at the six, and then this is a two one, and nothing says. You have to start on the downbeat. You can stay on that. You can stay on the, the, the suspended note for longer than the res resolution. You could be on the suspended note for an eighth note, and then you spend the rest of the bar on the root or on the on the resolve note, or you could sit on that suspended note for almost the entire bar and resolve it, you, or you could never resolve it. You don't, you know, there are no rules. Um, you learn the rules and then you ignore them when it comes to creativity. I always say, you know, you look, you know, you've heard me say this many, many times. You learn the, the, the music theory. You learn, you know, the the names of the chords. You learn. One six, you know, one. What is what is a one four five one four one five six four progression? What does that mean? Um, you learn this kind of stuff because it helps you figure out stuff. Because ninety nine percent of the song songs that we listen to, well, I wouldn't say ninety nine. Say ninety percent of the songs we listen to really pretty much tend to stay within a pretty fixed, uh, 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 you know, in a very small yard. You know they don't go outside of this yard they may just here's these five chords or these four chords or six chords um in in a major key like a key of c you know the one chord's very common obviously the four chords very common five chords pretty common and the six chords very common and then the two chord and the three chord yeah they happen the two chords more common than the three chord three chord of those six chords is the least common and the three chord here would be e minor the two chord is d minor so we have c major d minor e minor f G major G major and a minor those are the those are the six main chords in the key of C we don't really have a lot of songs that, in C that have a B diminished chord in it okay um, but those are the six main chords and that's a great starting point because if we were to look at all the potential major and minor chords you have 12 notes um, and you would have 12 major and minors that's 25 24 chords well if you can limit it if you can figure out what key you're in, you can limit that down to the most the most likely chords are going to be those six chords, and you could even probably eliminate one of those, the three chord. Um, and so um, now there may be 
alternate bases in these chords. Uh, you might have a one over E, and it may sound like, oh, that's an E minor chord. It's like, no, that's a, that's a, that's the one over the three. So, um, but my point being that when it goes to figuring out a song, okay. Like if I were trying to, if I didn't know the song and I was trying to figure it out. Um, okay, everybody take a sip. I'm changing guitars. Um, I knew the song was in the key of C. I start with the C chord. Oh, okay, that's it. Okay. Okay, it changes. What does it change to? Is it A minor? Or oh, F, F. No, that's not right. Okay, so the most second, the third most common chord in the key of C is gonna be G. Let me try that. That's it. Okay, then now F. No, that's not right. F's not right. Okay, but F is the second most common chord. What's the? So oh, is it? Oh, maybe it's C again. To G. Okay, so C again. That's what it's. No, no, nope, something's different. Okay, so that's and that you know, uh, <laughs> I'm pretending to not know the song. Um, I'm going. Okay, that's that may. Be, let's try the A minor because that's the third. It's a fourth most likely chord. G. Okay, now A minor. Now, of the four most likely chords, F is left. Let's see if that's right. Okay, that's, yeah. So, it, you know, you can really, I basically, by, by knowing the key, I could eliminate 18 chords, 18 possible, because, it, because for me, right then and there, it was a trial and error thing. And I can listen, you know, that, that that's one of the things that I, I wished, like the kids that were really good in, in dictation and music theory in high school were the ones that would close their eyes and listen to the dictation, the piano, you know, the teacher would play. So it would be like. And they would just close their eyes and they would listen to it remove, you know, like I said, with closing their eyes, they would remove any kind of distractions visually and, it, and their ears would kind of be a little bit stronger and then they would hear it and memorize it and they put it in their little tape recorder in their head and then they would play it. They would be able to play it back and, and write it out. I was always like, totally did it wrong. I'd be like, and I'd be like, uh, see, uh, see, mm -hmm. Okay, what was that second note again? <laughs> and it was like, and they're only gonna play it three times. And I'm like, oh shoot, what was it? Uh, you know, and it was the kids, the kids that listened. I don't do that. The kids that listened that were the able to kind of get get good at dictation. Uh, there was basically three three sections of your grade for music theory classes in high school, even in college. I took and in the college as well. And about a quarter of your grade was dictation where they would play something. And then eventually it became, they were playing, you know, like chords and stuff. And it was like, you know, and you'd be like, uh, but, um, one, so that was one quarter of the grade. One quarter of your grade, um, was solfage or singing. So you'd have to sight sing something. So you'd have music and then you would sing that. And that would be a quarter of your grade. And then the rest of your grade would be all the music theory homework and all the paperwork that you had to do and the test you took and everything. So it was, and you know, the part of the problem was singing in front of people. Um, uh, you know, uh, and then that, so that really affected your solfage because you got, you have to sing by yourself in front of a class of maybe 20 kids. And uh, so that was, that added a whole, other layer, like a fear of failure, but nobody was perfect. So eventually you realized, okay, I think I got this or whatever. And other kids were like, they just could do it. They were just really good at reading. And the orchestra players, and see most of the kids in my music theory class, I probably, if I, now when I think about it, I was the only guitar player. Everybody else was in the orchestra or in the wind ensemble. So they all were good readers and they were all used to, you know, seeing notes. So. Oh, your first job was at a fabric store. Interesting. What time is it? Yeah, we can start talking. We can start talking about the question. What was your first job? So Holly was at a fabric store. Well, that's kind of fun. Went to apparel from there. Oh, nice. Never had, I worked in a restaurant. You know my, yeah, I worked at Gringo's. <laughs> the most poorly named Mexican restaurant in the world. I don't, 
think the food was very good. I, I can I can still kind of taste the food there though. It, it, yeah, it was, and you know, my first job, my first, not my first job, my, my, the first thing I had to do when I went to work at Gringo's, I had to turn on the fryer because the fryer would be white because it coagulated overnight. <laughs> One night I left it on all night and they were mad at me for that. Um, but, uh, or somebody did, I don't know that I did, but it was, it had been on all day, all night long. And of course it's, it's, um, it's those heat coils all around the, the, the metal tub. And so it's probably like 3000, no, not three. Yeah. Maybe 3000 Watts, like, like two powerful hair dryers going all night. So it's probably would use a lot of energy. It was easier to turn it off and then re because we would get there, what, an hour, hour and a half before it op we opened? Maybe maybe two hours before we opened? Um, I, I, I don't remember if, how, if I opened more or closed more. I can't, I can't remember. But, um, but yeah, so the first thing you do is you turn on that fryer so that, that coagulated grease can turn into just uncoagulated grease. Bush pig, what's going on? McDonald's, well, it's cool. There you go. See, you, so you know exactly then an electrical factory. Technically, technically, my first job was mowing grass. I, I had one, maybe two, three, three different uh, houses on my street that I mowed, my house and then two others that I mowed grass for. And I think it was five dollars a, a, a yard. And so, um, so basically fifteen dollars a week. It took me a couple summers, I think, to save up enough money to buy my first Les Paul. I think it was three hundred dollars. Um, and it, and I, that I, I would have been. That would have been like 1976 and 77, maybe 77. And uh, I bought it from a, f a friend of my sister's and uh, it was a fretless one. It was like a 71 Les Paul. Um, there's some pictures of it, me playing it somewhere. Uh, let's see, I, there's, I can find them, hold on. I'm so skinny. Back then, let's see. Okay, boop here. Um, <laughs> there I am. I, this, I think this is like I'm seven. It's I'm maybe sixteen years old there. Uh, and there's the Les Paul, and it, it was a it was a custom. Gold hardware, which my hands don't, I, my sweat doesn't like gold hardware. It just comes off. Uh, probably because I would never wipe it down after I played. I still don't do that. Um, yeah, the hair. Yeah, not really not a hairdo. It's just a lot of hair. I really had no hair plan back in those days. Um, just hair parted down the middle. Really zero thought to my hair, which was kind of the style of the day. I mean, I think I was a little bit, people were probably get, well, the seventies, people would just have long hair and jeans. And, you know, that was a pretty common plaid shirt. You know, that was a pretty common look for the, for Indiana in the seventies. That's at Brad's house, Brad's parents' house, the drummer's house. Of course, you're going to practice at the drummer's house because, uh, you know, you don't want, it's easy, easier to set up guitars and stuff. And as you can see the PV column behind me, that wasn't my amp. My amp was an acoustic amp, acoustic, the company acoustic amp. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it took me all summer or maybe two summers to afford to buy that thing. Eh, maybe, maybe. I, th I also house sit. I did some house sitting. So one of the families that I cut their grass, I house sit for them when they went out of town. So um, not didn't mean a whole lot. It just meant going over there, collecting the mail, putting in the house. I don't think they had a pet. Um, just going and making sure everything was cool and then going home. Was, hey, Kevin, what's going on? Clothing style hasn't changed. You're right. I mean, I'm still wearing jeans and a plaid shirt. <laughs> You're right. Uh, yeah, except that wasn't flannel. Like, I don't remember flannel. Only lumberjacks wore flannel. Like, that was, or maybe to, to bed. Like, you would wear flannel to bed. Uh, in pajamas were flannel, but in lumberjacks were flannel back in, back in the seventies. So, um, but yeah, so my, but my first real job was working at that music store. So that was cool. Um, I worked at a, 
consigned space at Sears that was consigned by a music store that I actually never went to. I think it was called Rocky's Music in Zionsville, Indiana. I never actually ever went to the mothership. Um, and the cool thing was they were a Gibson dealer, a Fender dealer, and a Martin dealer. So they had all three Gibson Fenders and Martins in the store. And it was on the second floor of this. It was in the Sears on the second floor of the mall behind the refrigerators and the albums like the records were there. Um, I remember them playing like Boston. That was when the first Boston album came out. And I think I worked there. It was, I don't even know if it said Rockies. Maybe it said Rockies music, but that's who paid my paycheck. That's what my paycheck came. I had to go to the Sears office every week to get my paycheck. And um, I'm pretty sure the pay came from Rockies, not from Sears. And I got minimum wage or something plus tip, uh, plus not tips, commissions like two or three percent commission so if i sold a thousand dollar guitar i'd make like 20 bucks uh although there weren't many guitars for a thousand dollars they did have a, a gibson rd um it was kind of weird shaped it had a bunch of buttons had battery in it um i remember playing that one uh, i don't know that we ever sold that thing i also remember we had some gibson l an l6 that had the six-way switch on it Kind of looked like a stripped down Les Paul. We had Les Pauls there. I didn't end up buying anything there. I only worked there like six months. And then I got laid off because they I, they either closed it or one of the bosses came and started working there because, and they liked me, but they just weren't making enough money and they couldn't justify paying me because there were days where we wouldn't have any sales. You know, maybe a set of strings or a guitar pick or, you know, something, but... Uh, there weren't a lot of accessories back then. I'm going to do, what is this? We're in March, right? Yeah, I'm not, it's a little early for that, but I, I'm going to do an accessory video, which is, I think, I you know, stocking stuffer video. I'll probably do one in November or something like that, where I'll put a bunch of links in there. That's not a bad idea. And there's, I have all, so many things that I, um, I use um, and um, that are different and weird and like, slides and picks and capos and tuners and mutes i mean just those just those there i put the links in there that could generate a little bit of revenue so i appreciate all that i appreciate you if you click on any of the amazon links or sweetwater links in this video and then you go do your shopping i get a little piece of that uh, up upwards to five percent not always so if you spend a thousand dollars i wouldn't get fifty dollars but it would be you know, it would be a percentage of that. So, you know, 20, 30 bucks, which is appreciated. So if you've got a lot of planning, if you plan on doing a lot of shopping at Amazon, just click on one of those links. You can even save it as a bookmark if you want. And so, uh, yeah, I'm drinking coffee. We'll see. Uh, I'm about halfway. I'm thinking maybe I'll stop. Hard to stop sometimes because it's automatic. Uh, but the sinusitis is gone. So I don't have that infection anymore. Um, and I think it was the infection in my system combined with the coffee that was kind of giving me the shakes like I feel fine now um and I was kind of having this little bit of an anxious feeling so um but yeah um let's see what's this picture Yeah. Oh, here. Okay. I'll put, I'll, I'll put this picture up here so you can see the amp I was playing through. See in the back there that that's an acoustic amp. It was a 212 cabinet. Really loud. And we're playing, that's at the high school. So we're playing at my high school. I don't remember. I think we played at like a, a mixer. I think it was a mixer. I don't think it, it wasn't homecoming or, um, well, maybe it was homecoming. It could have been home. No, homecoming. No, that was a bigger event. I remember seeing Manchild play at my homecoming. Um, and that was when I think Manchild played at my homecoming and I'm probably, I maybe talked to him. Um, Babyface was in the Manchild. He's from, he went to my high school and he was in a band called Manchild and then he became Babyface. Um, 
And so, uh, yeah, he was ahead of me. He went to high school with my sister. It was a big school, so I don't even know if my sister knew him. Um, and then, and then Faith Band played at my high school. And uh, I remember going to that. I don't think I went to the, it was a, it, that was for a homecoming. A homecoming, so there's prom and there's homecoming. Homecoming's in the fall and prom's in the spring. And homecoming is technically for people to come to go to a game and then afterwards they have a dance. Um, so it's usually in Indiana, it was a football game because yeah, it was football season. Um, most high schools do that. And, um, and so Faith Band played on that. And Faith Band was kind of a big band. They got signed by Mercury along with Roadmaster. Um, and they had a hit that they, I don't know how this happened, but uh, Nigel Olson. I think the drummer for Elton John released the song Dancing Shoes, which was written by Carl Story of Faith Band. And Faith Band released it like the same week. <laughs> so they there were two versions of Dancing Shoes climbing the charts and Faith Band's hit like 40. And and I think, and then um, Nigel's, I think, hit the, maybe hit the top 10. I don't know. But it was kind of a bummer because... Um, uh, yeah, it was kind of like a bad launch to a career. Like, who, whose idea was that? Um, and so Carl, I guess, was a songwriter, you know, was maybe working as a songwriter and had sold the song. And then Nigel wrote, it's like, man, that was, that was a drag. So, um, but uh, <clears throat> there's uh, maybe, and, and maybe I'm just mistaken. Maybe it's not the same song. Maybe it's just two songs called Dancing Shoes. But I, I'm pretty sure it's just, I'll, I'll check it out, and not now, but uh, later I'll check it out. Uh, <coughs> but it was a, you know, put on your, put on your, let's put on your dancing shoes, put on your dancing shoes. No, it is not. Might have been one. I can't remember what the chord progression was uh, or the song, you know, very much about the song, but um, it, it was, it was a ballad. It was a, in fact, I think it was, well, it was kind of a hit at the time of the prom. I mean, the homecoming dance and they played it and uh, oh, sip. Oh yeah. Take a sip. <laughs> Cause I, it's one of our drinking game rules. Uh, if I, if I change guitars, everybody takes a sip. So, um, so yeah, so, but my so my first job was working at that music store and then when that bailed then i worked at gringo's so i was like six months at, at rockies then and that was during high school um that was during high school i was still in school when i was so i probably started working in the fall of 78 probably got through christmas and i remember that uh we had the the oil embargo and gas went from 50 cents a gallon to a dollar a gallon. And they gave me a $20 a week raise because the drive, I was driving a Ford country squire station wagon and you know, but a boat and I probably get 10 miles a gallon. And I was driving from one side of town to the other. And so I was actually, it was almost not worth it for me to drive across town, even at a dollar a gallon for minimum wage, which was like three twenty-five or something at the time. So Kevin, what's going on? What was my first professional kick? Oh, um, my first professional gig came shortly after that. So um, I had a band at the same time. So when I'm, I'm in high school, right? And junior high, man, I, I had a band in junior high and I get to high school and I was having a hard time finding a, finding a band. So I decided I was gonna start doing like jazz. So my teacher, I had him show me a bunch of chord melodies and I started learning all those things. Well, then I got a, but then I found some bandmates, some, a band that was looking for a guitar player. And so we joined up and then we got a, um, we got a manager, uh, this guy named Kevin Gassaway who owned Music Sound, uh, City Sound in Indianapolis. And they had like 20, 30, 40 bands. Uh, and his band was a band called Malachi and they were the big band. So if there were good gigs to be had, he had it, and this is, so this was, this actually might have been, if not my first, my first of, like, my fifth 
in top five first gigs of my not down here that's just at brad's house that's at my high school and we probably got paid to do a mixer there i don't know we probably got 50 dollars or something so we each made 10 bucks but um that was um uh, that was probably my first one of my first gigs so my first professional gig was playing in our top 40 band and we were basically doing a lot of disco um i think we did hold the line by toto um which would have been 78 uh but we also did like boogie oogie oogie by uh, uh boogie, yeah, boogie taste of honey we had a we had a female singer we had a sax player with a he played keys we had a drummer, a bass player, and a, another singer that played guitar. So we had two guitar players, bass, keys, female singer, and sex. I don't know. Let's see if I can find it. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, this was before we got, when we had a different singer. So this definitely would have been one of my first gigs ever. And it was it would have been a paying gig. So let's see. All right, so if I have room for another shot here, I can make these smaller. So that's basically my first Les Paul. It wasn't my first electric, it was my second electric. I still have my first electric, which is cool. All right, my first electric was an Ibanez 175 copy. Uh, so where was that photo? Where did it go? Here it is. So you can see Janice there in overalls, which is totally the big wide leg overalls. Oh my gosh, those are so in the fashion today. Look how skinny I am. <laughs> there I am. I can make this bigger so we can all see it. Uh, and there's Brad the drummer. Believe it or not, he's a high school student. He's got a full freaking beard in the red shirt there. He's like maybe 17 there. Isn't that hilarious? I, I didn't have facial hair. I didn't even have a I didn't have to shave until I was 25 or 30. Pat, the bass player there, he he was shaving too. He was 13. The bass player there was 13. He got he got a, a, a girl pregnant when he was 15. Uh, and then that's uh, Roger Chase there as a singer, and that didn't last very long. He didn't get along well with Scott, this keyboard player. So Scott got rid of him, and we got Julian. And Julian's not in this shot, but Julian, he was the guitar player, uh, the other guitar player. Um, and... He grew up in Indiana, but he was, let's see, he was a Pakistani descent. So his parents were from Pakistan, but he, he, uh, yeah, this Roger. And that, oh, and that's my dad's congas. Oh my gosh, I forgot. So if there's congas, because remember disco, there was a lot of conga drums, a lot of congas in disco. <laughs> so those are pretty fun pictures though, huh? Your first gig uh, as an intern during college was George George Clinton and Parliament. Oh, what? <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. Oh, man, that must have been so loud. Parliament Funkadelic is so freaking amazing. Yeah, we yeah, it was disco, man. It was full on disco. Um, I actually did. I do. I still have that. Did I do a Spotify playlist of all? You know, I, I did Spotify playlist to share. Originally, it was. You could do playlists in iTunes, but I did. I, I think I did Spotify playlists of. The, oh, the name of the band was Rendezvous, which you know French. It was like Jordache jeans. It was like you know it sounded like disco. It's it sounded adult. Um, let's see. Bum, 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 bum. Did I do a? I'm looking through my playlist here. Because at one point I went through and I actually reached out to all the guys. Oh, here we go. Here's a set list. Uh, let's see. Oh, Help Is On The Way. Uh, Little River Band. Reminiscing by Little. I hated that song. Baby Come Back. That was a big. I love that song. It was fun to play that. I had a. I think I had a, a phase shifter that I would get that. Da -da -ba -da 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 -da. Uh, Ambrosia, Biggest Part Of Me. Oh, Blue Morning, Blue Day by Foreigner. Remember that record? Hot Blooded we did. Love Will Find a Way by Pablo Cruz. What You Gonna Do? Um, these are more the rock tunes. I The disco tunes aren't in there, so I'm gonna have to go find some. You know, they, they're recommending some tunes and I'm not seeing any Lonesome Loser we didn't do. We didn't do any Seals and Cross, no Orleans, no Orleans, no Lady Little Riverman, no. 
how much of I'm going to have to reach out um, and do a, do a you know like kind of a, a rendezvous set list. Um, <laughs> so, but here's what happened. So we and so we did we we would do like I said we did not not many gigs, but we did our agent our booking agent uh, Kevin booked us on some fraternity gigs. So we had a fraternity gig on a Saturday in IU and a, a Sunday at IU, and we actually stayed at uh, <clears throat> my my sister's boyfriend um, was a, a art professor at IU, and he had a, uh, a house that he and several artists um, uh, rented to use as an art studio. There were like four artists there. And he actually lived in the house. He wasn't supposed to, but he was living there. So I, but when I called Gwen to say, hey, can, can we get a place to stay somewhere? Because, you know, keep in mind, this is a pretty big band, right? Uh, guitar, two guitar. Uh, this was with Julian. So not this band, this, the one different person. But it was, yeah, guitar, bass, drums, keys, female singer, and another guitar player. So that's six. So it was quite a few people. And we had a sound man. So it was seven. Al Thompson, I think, was our sound man. So we had seven people and a truck and we uh, needed a place to crash. So David said, yeah, just crash my house. I'll stay with your sister. And I was like, oh crap, <laughs> I'm making him sleep with my sister. I was kind of upset about that. And uh, you know, like, oh shoot, and, uh, you know, being a good Christian boy, I was like, oh, dang it. But anyway, uh, in fact, that plays into the story because um, when we, we did the gig, uh, we did a, it was a nighttime party. And we had a, a ice cream social Sunday afternoon to do. Um, and so that's why we were staying down in Bloomington, so we ha didn't have to drive down there twice. And um, so we're, we're sleeping up on the second floor in one of the rooms. Of course, it smelled like paint because they're painters, you know. But we're sleeping. We're all just sleeping on the floor. And I think it was our floor. We all brought sleeping bags. And Janice, <laughs> we're all sleeping on the floor. And this Janice is in the van, and she she didn't want to sleep near anybody but me. She she slept right next to me because she trusted me, but she didn't trust any other guys in the band because she knew I was a good boy. So so she slept next to me, and then you know in our sleeping bags, we didn't zip them together or anything like that. No. And then uh, and 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 yeah. So it was kind of like yeah. She was like no, nope, I'll I'll sleep over here, and so. It worked out. It was fine. We, we, we got some sleep, not much. Uh, we were goofing off and, of course, probably bought pizza and lots of bad food and stuff and probably a lot of Coke and Coca-Cola. Sorry, not cocaine. And we're up a bit. Uh, Pat was a character, like I said, he was probably 13 at that point. I mean, I don't know where his, his parents, his actually dad was a psychiatrist. Um, and uh, Pat was crazy. And he, like I said, he got a... He got like this twenty-year-old girl pregnant when he was when he was fifteen. Uh, this was the '70s, so you know there was a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Um, and um, but but so you know that so having two gigs on the same weekend, and we were probably made like two or three four hundred dollars for those gigs. So we were actually like, wow, we're actually making some real money. And of course, we had to pay the sound man to rent his system, and he came and ran sound. So you know he made a hundred bucks or whatever, and. It worked out, but Kevin, who was in charge of the of the booking agency, really liked my guitar playing. Um, and to, when I at the time, I didn't think I was a better musician than certainly not better than Scott, the keyboard player, who also played sax. Because like I couldn't play sax, he was a good keyboard player. You know, we did a lot of Doobie Brothers too, and um, uh, so. Um, I, uh, I didn't think I was like much better than any of them. I just thought we were all pretty much the same, but Kevin saw something in me that I didn't see. And so he brought me into Malachi, which was his band. And of course, Malachi got all the best gigs. Well, Malachi, so then I'm, so I literally like, I did a gig right around my 18th birthday with them where I was technically only supposed to be a warm body on stage because they were firing two guys in the band. So they went from a seven piece to a five piece and they, but they were hired to be a seven piece. So they at least wanted to be a six piece when they showed up at this gig so that they didn't, the, 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 it was at Culver military Academy. Oh, it was here. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I'm wearing the shirt. It was at Culver at a dance. 
uh, and it was an all boys school and they just recently gone COVID. So it was, you know, they were doing dances cause they had girls going to the school now too. And, um, military school. And, um, so I just, I, I don't think I did a rehearsal or anything. I brought my guitar and amp and they had charts for me. So I was reading the charts and playing the songs and I kind of knew them. And again, there was no way for me to listen to these songs in advance unless I had the albums. I mean, cassette tapes were a thing, but they just said, just show up and pretend to play, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, okay, well, I actually, you know, and they'll say, well, maybe you could take a solo or two. And I did a great job. And on the way home, we're driving home. And I, ex the crazy thing is I remember exactly where I was when they, when Bruce asked me and said that we want you to be in the band. And these guys were all 10 years older than me. They were like in their, they were 25 to 30 and they all had real jobs like attorney, judge, uh, orderly in a hospital, cobbler, boiler maker. I know it sounded like rub a dub tub, right? Um, and um, uh, uh, see, there was also a, oh, a parole officer. <laughs> so it was like it ran the gamut. And this was, but this is what they did for fun. And we had two rehearsals a week, Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday rehearsals. And then Friday and Saturday, almost every weekend we were booked. So I was making money almost every weekend going from, you know, just a gig here and there with rendezvous to, to doing a gig, every, two gigs a weekend with Malachi. Um, and they were all like pretty good paying gigs. You know, I, I, I actually ended up saving quite a bit of money, uh, to move to California because of that. Um, but I remember, so Culver is this is on Lake Max and Cookie. Lake Max and Cookie is like a shape, lake kind of shaped like the shape of my hand. And then Culver's uh, kind of on the northern, let's see, the northeast corner of the lake. It's a city, and it kind of wraps around the top here. It's a beautiful campus. They want there was a movie called Taps that was in maybe 1980, 81. Uh, that was Sean uh, uh, Sean Penn. And they wanted to film it there, but there were no hotels. I mean, it's just like literally they would all be staying, having to drive really far to, to do the filming. Um, uh, but that was, um, uh, Culver was there. And so there was two ways to get to Culver. There was thir Highway 31 that goes right up the middle of Meridian, you know, right up the middle of, of Indiana. And you can take the exit down here and go like this. And it's a lot of country roads and stuff. And then you kind of come up along the side of the lake. And it's great. And then the friends that lived there, um, and I'd been to Culver before, but the friends that lived there or had a house there was, uh, was right right about here on the lake. So you had a sunset every every night, which was great um, on the lake. But um, so you, And then you would drive along the lake and come here. And then there was another way where you go like this. And at one point on this country road, there was a 90 degree turn to the north and a, and shortly half not even a half a mile after that a 90 degree turn to back to the east and then 31 and down so technically that was a little bit faster because it was straighter and it wasn't as long on the windy road so we're going back and i'm in bruce's car and it was after that 90 degree turn and before the other one where he asked me <laughs> to join the band and my kids you know we've been to culver since i've been there many times even since i moved to california and with the kids and everything, and we usually we're going to Michigan, so we're we're driving the south, come up 31, we go up this way, we come in there and stay at the cottage or hang out there, and then we would go go get some food at Culver, and then drive that road. And every time I would tell them the same story, I'd be like, "Yep, yeah, this is where my band, where Malachi asked me to be in the band." I mean, it was it was for me one of those kind of pivotal moments of my that directed me to being a musician. Um, it was like, wait. I'm good enough to really play with you guys. I thought I was just pretend playing and they go, no, no, we really want you to be in the band. I'm like, okay. And so that was a lot of, that was a lot of, a lot of fun. And it was like I said, getting to work every weekend and they just, I think they really liked my energy cause I was younger and they, gosh, I think all of them were married. It's crazy to think about it though. You know, I mean, none of them were younger than 25 and I think every one of them were married. Every one of them just got, uh, well, no, let's see, Ke uh, Kevin got married. Some of them got married while I, we, I was in the band. And then all of them either were even, either married before I got in the band or once I joined the band, they got married. So by the time I moved to California, they were all married. And uh, and then the guy that actually, the funny thing is the guy that sold me that Les Paul, who was a friend of my sister's, uh, he ended up taking my place. Um, and so he's a great guitar, John Dinwiddie, great guitar player. When t I talk about most influential guitar players. He's actually one of them because he, uh, because I, I could actually jam with him. 
and he took me to jams like when I was 15 years old I would go to these jam sessions um, and that was why I told you where they're like sitting around the corner and then they'd pass a joint around and I would just take it because I didn't want to smoke weed you know I just hand it to the next person and they never ever went oh come on man smoke it you'll be cool they were kind of like I was I was by far younger than everyone else in this jam session um, and they I think they just said oh, okay we'll we'll um, uh, yeah, you're you're a good guitar player. We don't want to mess with that, you know, kind of thing. I think, or they or they just didn't want to get in trouble for. But uh, let's see. Actual lesson usually starts around five minutes after. Yeah, sorry, or somebody complain about me not teaching anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see who's who's on here. Oh, John. Hey, John. What's going on, Kevin? Oh, Kevin. I already said hi. Uh, uh, anyone else? Yeah, we got, actually got. Yeah, sorry, we now we're at the kind of the peak of people being in in the. You know, on the on the on the live stream. So um, I'm gonna play. I'll, I'm gonna play over this a little bit. Of this progression. I'm just gonna use that blues blues tone again. A lot of I'll tell you what. A lot of um, my approach to a solo is tone related. So I've got right now. I've got kind of a blues tone. <laughs> long way to go on this soloing you know because because we're going to come up with some other approaches to to soloing over this progression but the the tone will inspire how i approach it so let me show you like it with the blue and i'm not going to go bluesy on this but it still will affect because i'm going to try to stay within the things that we've been talking about and i'll leave those pictures up there because i think they're just kind of fun they're a little bit small but six nine Oh no, major plumbing. Ooh, yeah, you got a compound up there, don't you, Holly? Okay, here we go. I'm gonna melodic um, but I might also hit notes more because it doesn't sustain like it would if I did a, a like a really hot rock sound see in other words like it's gonna fade out so I might do you know I might I might hit notes more because the tone is not so gainy but if I go to like a hot lead tone I'm gonna I might I might approach it, and I might also go up an octave.
Now I'm playing chord tones. different approach really I, I, and then if I went to the Pat Metheny sound the clean jazzy tone same kind of thing I, I, it's going to really affect how I approach so I, always, I recommend changing your tone you know Think more like Adam Levy almost, you know, with that with that clean sound. Um, Adam Levy sound might be somewhere between the Metheny sound and the blues sound, like a little brighter and maybe a slight gain to it if you dig in. Um, but yeah, and 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 in that scenario, I might play more court, you know, chordy stuff. So like, let's, let's see. Uh, let me duplicate this Metheny sound and see if I can kind of tweak it a little bit. Pull up guitar rig. Uh, first off, I'm going to turn off the that. Keeping in mind, I got a lot of bass rolled off on this. Um, turn on the bright. I mean, I, could, I don't have any gain technically here. Um, I could maybe gain up the compressor a little bit. Uh, I don't know if that would work, but let me see. Might be getting too loud for the room. compression because I feel like it's maybe too much. Hey, hey Max, what's going on? Uh, let's see. All right. Now, uh, and what else can I add? There's delay. More delay. Reverb. Wait, where are we reverb wise? too much compression I, I feel I can I can really yeah 
not bad. That's kind of a starting, good starting place. Um, you could even add some more mids. Maybe a little bit more spring reverb. Vibrato. <laughs> Slow it down. So yeah, if I was playing with that kind of tone, maybe a little bit, um, the tremolo is actually kind of cool. I don't really like the tremolo in guitar rig very much, but I'm gonna go with it even slower. Turn this up a little bit, but let's see. I still feel like I need compression. I got it off right now, but I feel like it's over compressing. It just needs to kick on very little. But if I was gonna approach it with that tone, this tone, this progression, be very chordal, very patient. G chord over the C, stay there, stay there, resolve on the F. Very simple but beautiful. that sound I'm even gonna call it Adam Levy <laughs> when I see him I say hey, dude I saved the sound named after you uh, let's see save his channel strip setting as Adam Levy or Levy probably Levy all right where uh, I gotta put it I'll put it in my sound alike folder I'd be more likely to find it there although I could also save it in another folder um, like a clean it's smart to kind of save those settings in a couple different places. Just like you might not, I'm like, oh, where did I, that sound I did, it was kind of Adam Levy. But again, totally different approach. The tone is going to change how you hear the chords. Well, and of course, how the chords are played. I mean, this is a super mellow track. Um, and so it would definitely kind of lend itself well to this kind of playing. I like that. Back and forth. Make that an exercise because I want to work on it. No gap. That's the hard part. set it up with a picky land on that note with my picky oh 
don't know, Adam's great. He's great. And he, he's kind of one of those players that's always restrained. Like his, what he chooses to do over a good, over a part is, you know, one tenth of of his ability is showing through. You know, like he can he can play so much more, but he's he's thinking compositionally, which is exactly what I'm talking about. When I mentioned about talking play, playing over a pop track, and definitely Nora Jones would be kind of a pop trap track. Uh, tr certainly was a pop hit. Um, but when you, when you talk about, um, playing over, um, you know, that you, you want it to make sense. So you have to be more of a composer than a guitar player. And I definitely compose, I would love to compose for film. I actually, I might have two film gigs this year where I'm going to be composing for films. I'll let you know. Um, I didn't compose on this, but if you have Apple Plus, you can check out Palm Royale. I played on that. You can hear me um, on that. Uh, any, not all guitar you hear, because there was another session that I couldn't make, that they had a different guitar player. I was glad they called me back for the third session, but um, I did some uh, classical stuff, uh, flamenco, uh, kind of flamenco, kind of more like samba kind of thing with guitar solo. So you can hear that. I think it was in the third episode. Um, I thought it was going to be in kind of a, a sexy moment, and I'm like, it wasn't that sexy. It ended up not being that. Um, ended up not being kind of what I, I was afraid, because <laughs> the cue was called Robert's Secret, and I'm like, uh-oh, what's Robert's Secret? <laughs> so I know he's gay in the show, although that hasn't been revealed yet, but it's kind of a, I, I, I'm pretty sure he is. I don't, you know. Um, but uh, um, anyway, Tom's talent rolls off his fingers. Yeah, I, I, a Maroon 5, yeah. Uh, on a Howard Stern show, he did a Purple Rain cover. Unbelievable. Oh, 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 I'll have to check that out. Interesting. Howard Stern, wow, yeah. Um, did he work, work with Adam Levy? I don't think. Oh, uh, Adam, oh. Uh, am I thinking of the wrong guitar player? Am I? Did I just? You're right. Is Adam Levy is the lead singer for Maroon Five? Adam Levy, jazz guitarist. No, I got it right. Okay. Nora Jones band. Yeah, that's a perfect fit. You know, have a jazz guitar player in there, but he's not trying to play bebop over it or anything like that. So, um, played with Roseanne Cash, uh, Tracy Chapman. A uh, bunch of names I don't know. Amos Lee, I know. Lisa Loeb, Mike Love. Uh, I, you know, I don't think I have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> now, a Norwegian politician named Tom Straley. So, uh, he asked me, did I mean Tom Strange? Well, maybe. Um, I haven't done one. I don't really, uh, I don't know. I don't like the fact that you can't control what's up there. Um, so it's better not to have one up there because somebody could say something about me and be, you know, their opinion or just not true. So, um, okay, this I can close. Um, oh, so the kickoff, the new NFL kickoff rule, are they going to do it in the regular season or is it a preseason thing? I don't know. Or even if they're going to do it, I think they're voting on it. It was weird. So they're going to... The, Kicker's going to be at the 35, but the the um, kicking team, they're going to be at the 40-yard line of the opponent's 40-yard line. So I think it's an XFL thing. They're, they they still want the excitement of, of um, the kickoffs because they don't want to get rid of kickoffs altogether. Um, but they want to get rid of the injury. So if you can get rid of the head of steam that these insanely fast players, these gunners and stuff have, um, then potentially you can, can lower the injury. So I think the rule is the kickoff is at 35, but the that's 15 yards and then 10 yards. So 25 yards in front of the kicker is the kicking team. But they're not allowed to move until the guy has caught the ball. And so if he catches the ball at the goal line, then they won't actually come in contact with each other until about the uh, 20 yard line, potentially. And I'm not sure where the receiving team, how close they can be. They may only be able to come up to the 30 yard line. So I'm not sure if it'll result in a lot of kick, 
touchdowns or result in a lot of short returns. Um, but uh, it will it'll be interesting to see if they implement that rule and what it looks like. It just seems like such a major departure. It's going to be kind of weird. Adam Levine, yeah, Adam Levine is the is the lead singer for Maroon Five. One time when I was recording with Justin at Conway Studios in in on. Um, Santa Monica Boulevard, uh, Maroon 5 was recording in one of the other studios. So I got to, I, I met a couple of guys in that band. They didn't know who I was. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it was just, just one session I did with Justin there. I've done, I did sessions for Marco and Tony Solis there. So I'd, I've been to Conway a couple times. It's a, it's a beautiful little studio. I've probably been there more than, seems like I've been there more than twice, but I like the studio. Um, the, the room is, the wood is really old, the floor. It almost looks like it's off a, 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 an old ship. It's very, very uneven, and it's big pieces of wood. Um, so it's very old and it's been there a long time. I don't, I, I don't know what Conway Studios was originally. Let me see if it says. Um, oops. Yeah. See if they have a Wikipedia for it, because that probably, I heard this. Start early 70s. It was a recording studio. Uh, Elton John, CB Wonder recorded there. The complex was being built from the ground up by studio engineer. Okay, so so those floors are, so they may have gotten them from somewhere. Um, Vic, Vincent Von Hoff designed the studio from the ground up, so... Yeah, it's definitely a tough studio for paparazzi because it's kind of gated, so it's nice. Very private, secluded, a lot of woods and different areas that you can go and hang out in. It's just really a little water, very dark, you know, water and trees and stuff like that. It's really nice. It's, <laughs> is it the Howard? Oh, the birthday bash. Oh, okay, I see. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, I've got to get going too, so, um, but... Anyway, so yeah, so we've added the sixth. We're going to talk about the seventh of all these chords, and we're going to mess around with the seventh, okay? Seventh is a great tool. We're going to really have fun with the seventh. The seventh is beautiful, and um, it's, it's, we're, going to, we're going to work on that. But the seventh doesn't necessarily have a resolution. It does. It, seven usually wants to go to one, okay? Uh, but it doesn't have to, and so there's so many ways. And you can go to the, get to the seventh by uh, multiple different ways, too. So... Um, we're going to talk about that next week. All right. All right. Take care, everybody. Uh, what is it? It's been, oh, it's been two hours. Okay. I, I try to go two hours if I can make it. Um, and I'm working on some new, so I'm, I, 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 I shot a video that I want to do and I'm going to reshoot it. Um, so, uh, I, I, I'm going to organize it a little bit better. So I make sure that I get everything done and I want to get good camera angles for everything. I want it to really look nice. Um, and uh, bu 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 um, and then um, uh, I'm also uh, I think I'm going to try to write and record some more Django songs, some gypsy jazz songs. Um, I, I wouldn't mind having a whole album's worth of those. Um, and, ha uh, but I will, I will upload them one at a time. It costs more to do it that way on, um, whatchamacallit, uh, CD Baby. Uh, but I'm fine with that. And I have to have artwork done, uh, which I think I did the artwork myself on the last one. But if you go to Spotify and enter Tom Straley, you can, you can find the two songs that I've uploaded. Um, I, you know, I don't really have records that I put out or anything like that. I'm not really totally interested in doing that. Um, but I just, there's times what the reason I'm doing it is I write a lot of music all day long. I'm writing music. Most of the music I write, I don't really have any personal investment with. It's like music I'm designed to be giving to these, uh, production companies to use on their shows and stuff like that. So, um, I, I know that I'm not, it's not, they're going to get the publishing on it. I'm not going to own these songs outright. So it's fine. That's what I'm writing them for. Um, and then there are songs that I kind of want to keep the ownership of. So that one of the ways of doing that is to, to put them up on a Spotify thing like that. And then technically 
if somebody wants to use that song, 100% fine with that, but they have to license it. So they have to pay me uh, two licenses, one a sync and a, one a, a master, because um, I'm the record company and I'm the writer. So I own both of those masters. Now, it, I could still sell, <clears throat> sell both of those licenses for a dollar each. So $2, I make $2. I could totally do that if I really want my song in a certain project, because I know there's going to be back end on it. Um, but typical licenses might run 500 bucks each. Like I might get $1,000 to have one of these songs used in a movie if they really want to use it. But I've done dollar licenses before. Um, I've done, you know, $500 license for multiple songs, things like that, but I keep the writers. So, <clears throat> um, hey, hey, what's going on? I do have an electric guitar that I want to buy, but I don't know if it plays rock or modern chill style songs. Uh, can I send you a link? Uh, you can, yeah, you can, can you get to it right now? Oh, I don't know, you can't put it in the chat. Uh, just send it, I guess you could send it to the, so if you go to T Straley at Gmail, that's the uh, account uh, associated with this YouTube channel. So if you do that, um, I can see it there. Um, but probably Rock a Chill, it could do, I, you, I can use any guitar for any style. If it has humbuckers, it's, you know, like I use this guitar a lot for rock and you go, oh, well, that's a Strat. I'm like, yeah, but it's got humbuckers. These are hot rails. They're skinny, but they're humbuckers, so they, uh, they're they quiet. That's why I like it, but they also drive They're for, for driving. But I can do chill stuff with it, like this sound is totally fun. F uh, Fender Sonic Stratocaster uh, HTM. Electric guitar. Oh, funny. You must be on a, uh, Nate, you must be on like a German or a, a Dutch. Uh, okay. Let me, let me look that up. Hold on. I can, I think I can highlight this, right? Uh, Fender Sonic Stratocast. Uh, HT, HTMF. Okay. Let me look that up on, I'm going to go to Sweetwater. Um, well, and if you buy it, well, you probably buy it from somewhere else, but if you buy it from Sweetwater, go through one of my links and I'll get, like, I get a percentage of that. Fender Sonic Strat HTMF. Let me see what I get with that. MF. Mofo. Oh. Ultra HSS Sonic Blue. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, Fender Strat, I mean, Hendrix didn't have a problem using a Strat, and he was single coil Strat. I mean, there's a lot of great rock players that use Strats. Strat's my main guitar. I don't have a problem playing rock with a Strat. Um, why is this not going away? Go away. No. Put use it. Remove. Report. No. Anyway. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, yeah, I I, I don't think uh, Fender Sonic Strat, let me, let me just Google that because... Okay, let me see what this is. A Squire Sonic Strat, I see that. It's, it looks like single coil, so it's gonna be a little buzzy. You know, if you put if you put a really big distortion box in front of it, oh man, why are we at 31 now? I gotta, we got all of a sudden we, we're maxing out here. Everybody's showing up. Um, I'm not, I'm gonna keep talking for a minute. Um, uh, Mason from uh, Vertex just sent me a text, um, sent me the Dan Huff uh, interview on, he, for me to watch. Um, so hang on, everybody. I'll keep going. Uh, but yeah, so if you put a lot of gain, like if I did, like, for example, okay, so everybody get their drink ready. We're going to have a drinking game thing. So this is, if I go to this sound here, and I, I have, it's hissy. You, I, I don't, you probably can't hear this. It's hissy. But if I'm, if I'm soloing, playing notes, or you don't really hear the noise too much. You, you don't really hear any noise when I stop playing. But if I use my Squire, the ETA Squire, as I call it, or as 
the world calls it now. You hear a lot of hum, a lot of buzz. So, you know, uh, wh what I do is I usually turn on a noise gate on the track, so. But again, I have a volume pedal. I can turn that off when I'm not playing, or I can turn off the volume knob as soon as I end the chord and there's no noise. If I leave the volume up and leave my hands off the guitar, it's gonna hum and buzz. That's why they're called humbuckers, because humbuckers are, but a single coil. So for rock, yeah, it's great, but for like metal, you're probably gonna, like if you're doing like heavy metal or hard metal or like gothy kind of stuff or, or I don't know. Dennis, <laughs> help, me with, help me with metal genre titles. <laughs> Dennis is the expert there. There's like a billion different genres of hard rock. Um, and so if you, um, if you, um, if you do that, you know, if you're going to do that kind of stuff, then you're probably going to want something more with humbuckers. Um, and you might be able to get like an Ibanez or a Schecter or there's a bunch of different companies that make those, you know, guitars that have humbuckers, but they're shaped and feel like a Strat. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, if I turn off my volume or I've got a volume pedal or if I, you know, it, it won't be that noisy or if you have a noise gate, uh, a lot of times, like if I want, let's see, this is guitar rig. If I want to create kind of a chunky heavy metal sound, like the gate here is set at, at 62 dB, uh, but I could lower this down to like 32 dB. I would probably turn off delay and reverb. If I'm gonna do short, stabby kind of stuff like that, power chords, I will crank the gate up. So a lot of metal players will have really good noise gates on their pedal board so they can do that kind of. So you can do short things, but. Um, I mean, I would, Nate, I would try to, Nate's asking, should I, what, should I study on myself or um, with a school? I mean, um, I, it depends on what kind of school you're talking about. I, I don't know if that I would major in guitar, go to college and get a music major, especially if you're not, if you're going in as a beginner. Um, if they have little like schools or, or you can take a course at the community college or something like that, you could do that. It's going to be a group class probably. Um, if you can take, if you can afford private lessons, you know, if you find a teacher, that really likes what you like. I mean, I'm assuming you're not seven. Um, when I taught like seven, eight, nine, ten year olds, I would generally take them through a book like Alfred's uh, Alfred's Guitar Method or Mel Bay or something. So they had something very, very specific to practice every week. Like, get this song down, practice your finger position, blah, blah, blah. It was really, it was kind of easy teaching those kids because uh, it was hard maybe to keep their attention for 30 minutes in a lesson. Uh, but it was easy to give them something to work on and, and then tell their parents, okay, this is the song I wanted to work on, blah, 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 that kind of thing. Um, once a kid got to 11 or 12, they start to have a taste in music. So they would be like, oh, I really like Led Zeppelin or I like Jimi Hendrix or I really like punk rock or whatever. So then we I would kind of cater my lessons more to the style of music they really liked. And then I would sneak stuff in like theory or jazz or whatever and say, oh, hey, let's learn the solo to Sultans of Swing by Dire Straits. And... And so it was, that was kind of how I uh, taught was just, uh, it was just to keep the kid, in, you know, the student, I really want him to be interested. I want him to practice every week and really get into it. And if I was making him do a bunch of exercises or a bunch of theory in like, okay, now I want you to practice these seven C scales and have them memorized and be able to play at 180 BPM, uh, quarter notes and eighth notes and 16th notes by next week. And it's like, 
they're just gonna be sitting there doing it's not it's not music and so it's there's nothing really particularly inspired about that now some students devoured that i mean that was that was they like they love that kind of thing and, and as a teacher that was your job to kind of figure out okay what's going to motivate this kid every kid's different it might take you two or three or four months to kind of figure out exactly how they learn and and what what's the best mess method of teaching somebody is it like writing it out is it is it just showing them face to face um is it on music is it no tab you know things like that so i always try to get my kids to eventually if they really showed an aptitude for the guitar um i always tried to get them to learn a little bit of how to read music a little bit and kind of get them into that at least chord charts and things like that um and say hey why don't you try to get in the jazz band in high school um and uh that kind of thing so i had students that would do that and um you know now you know and it's like always trying to get them into bands and you know that's one of the best ways to get fast or get good fast is to be in a band um so uh so i'm going to turn these back on i'm going to set this back to where it was approximately where it was all right um all right so did we Oh, we're still, gosh, we're still up in the 27 range. Isn't that funny? What a slow burn we have here. I have to show you the, no real revenue from this, sadly. Um, it's going to be giant. Oh, no, it's not big. Okay, cool. This is today. This is today on NBC. Look, very, got up to, you know, 16 right there, and then kind of sat there between 16 and 24, and then I'm, I'm like, right here's when I said goodbye. <laughs> oh, you can't see my cursor, sorry. Right about here is where I said goodbye, and I'm like, and then I looked at it, and I'm like, wait, we're at 30, 31. That's crazy. That's, that's crazy talk. Anyway, all right, remove that. Yes. I see a lot of people have like chords or like tabs. I don't know how to call them. I probably can learn from them. Yeah, you can learn from tabs. Um, yeah, you can you can learn from tabs and, and from tab books and stuff. I mean, I learned a lot of stuff that way. Um, I was I took lessons until I was about 17, and then I was self-taught. So from the age of 9 to 17, and I took classical guitar lessons in college. Um, I took some lessons with a guitar player named Carl Verheyen here in L.A., maybe five lessons. I took a flamenco lesson recently. I paid for two, and I still haven't gone. It's way down south of me, and I haven't I haven't gotten up the <laughs> the motivation to drive all the way down. At this point, I'm just going to say keep the money, and if I'm going to get another lesson, I'm just going to go ahead and pay for another one. But because uh, I think he spent a couple hours with me, so um, we even talked about doing a YouTube video together. Uh, very good flamenco guitars, and he immediately helped me with some stuff. So. Um, I, I need I need to work on um, he helped me with my rascados, um and I need to practice those before I go back down there. I'm not necessarily learning to looking to be I told him specifically what I wanted to do, which was to basically be able to play a bunch of different um, particularly Spanish rhythms for TV and film and games like rumbas and sambas and different rascado different grooves and things like that. Um, so I, I got to work on that. I, I got to work on keeping my wrist loose for that kind of stuff. It's it's a, it's very foreign to how I normally play. So, uh, and, and the funny thing is, the guy that was the top call guy who passed away a couple of years ago uh, here in L.A. He was the number one guy. I watched some videos and I saw him playing. He was strumming with a pick, and I'm like, going, oh, so really? He's doing some of those. I can do all of the feels with a pick. <laughs> That's not a problem. I thought to be legit, you had to use your fingers. But even the guy that was the the most called guy in LA would occasionally use a pick. So I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that actually is hugely informative. Um, in fact, that guy, um, Ramon, tried to get, um, uh, what's the, I can't, the, the, the flamenco guy to do session work, to work on session work with him. Like, and, uh, and he just didn't really feel like he had an aptitude for it. It is definitely a, a different kind of thing. Um, and you, you, you're, sometimes when I'm doing studio work for games, movies, TV shows, or whatever, 
uh, I can forge my own path and do my own thing. So you kind of have to have those skills where you can kind of make it up as you go. Um, but that is never required of an orchestra player because the orchestra can't make it up. You can't have 80 people make up the same thing at the, on the fly. It won't happen. But guitar players, they expect that up. So you have to be able to, to sight read like an orchestra player and play exactly what they want. And you have to be able to kind of make it up as you go and embellish and make it your own. So it's kind of two different skill sets. I kind of have both. Um, the one that, that I'm lacking really is the ability to like sight read in a group setting. I can sight read, you give me music, I can read it, I can track and do all that stuff. But if I'm playing with an orchestra, there's an element of, of nerves that affect my ability to do that. And so I don't have those nerves when I'm home working. I played with orchestras from home by myself. Like they sent me the orchestra, I play over it. Or what I played over, they played orchestra later over what I did. And so that's, that's you know, the, the whole recording at home thing that I've been doing since for 20, at least 20 years, um, is kind of serves my, <clears throat> my uh, skill sets. So, uh, speaking of, I'm starting to get um, reached out to. All right, that's nothing. All right, okay. So, um, anyway, okay. So I've got to. I'm so like I said, what, what I was saying before. I'm gonna. I'm working on some new Django stuff. Most of my Django songs that I've already recorded and and I've put in the got into movies and things like that. Most of them are a little bit on the flashy side. I'm going to do ones that are a little bit more melodic. Uh, the one I'm working on right now is pretty fast. So it's it's kind of flashy. Just even the melody might be a little flashy because the tempo of the song is fast. Um, you're trying to impress your class. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, most guitar players play guitar to get the girls, you know. So uh, <laughs> even the girl guitar players. <laughs> um, but uh, oh, what's a beautiful song? Oh. Oh, uh, the, there's a video, a very chilly, nice music video name of Until I Found You, Stephen Sanchez. Uh, I can't play it right now because I would this video would get demonetized, but let me pull it up. Uh, and then maybe if you, if you join us next uh, Monday, I'm here every Monday. Uh, if you join us next Monday, maybe, um, uh, see, so what, what did you call it? Until I Found You. Until I Found You. Oh, yes, I know that song. No, that's a great song. I know, I know, yeah, I know that song. Yeah, I mean, that's not, that's not a particularly hard song to play. Um, uh, it's, it's, I, like I said, I can't, I wish I could, well, here, let me mute. So if you don't hear. It's going to be an ad first. Boop. Get rid of, mute that. Okay, so hold on. Uh, and I'm going to click into the song a bit because I want to. <clears throat> okay, hold on a second. Yeah, it's such a great throwback '50s kind of song. I really like that song when I heard it on the rock on the radio. Um, yeah, it's very simple. It's probably four chords. It's probably one six four five, um, something like that. Um, I think he goes. There's a minor, maybe a minor four chord in there, or something. A pretty, and it's almost all like.
Okay, remember I said that the three chord is rare? So it is, it's, it's like a four in, in the key B flat, it's like a four, to five, to one. But it's a very, and it's a triplet feel. So it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. I might call it a 12 8 shuffle. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, okay, dang it. I can't believe, okay, well, we're, we're back down in a 24 range. So, okay, now I'm going to log off. I promise uh, this is for real this time. And uh, so um, let's, uh, I'll see you next Monday. Oh, yeah. Um, I'll see you guys next Monday, hopefully. And we're going to talk about seven. So we did, we've talked about the second, the fourth, the sixth, and then we're going to talk about seventh. And then I'll probably talk more about approaching the solo and uh, how to, you know, like, should I use scales? We've talked about this, but scales, or should I use chords? Or should I think, how should I think? And really, the less thinking you can do, the better. The, the goal is to have a lot of skills at your fingertips so your fingers can do whatever you hear musically. And that's really what you want to get to, okay? Um, all right. Talk to you later. Bye.